This video is an introduction to hypothesis testing. We're going to be looking at hypothesis testing of proportions. Uh, in the last video, we looked at confidence intervals of proportions. This time we're going to look at hypothesis testing, the other, the other important piece of statistical inference. Now, first off, let's get an idea of just what hypothesis testing is. Well, you start with a hypothesis, okay? Some statement. Some statement that uh, uh, has a, that, uh, about a, a population parameter, okay? And we have doubts about that statement, okay? We have doubts about the hypothesis. And so, what do we do with our doubts? Well, we go out, we gather some data, and we see if our data and the hypothesis are consistent, or if possibly our data is not consistent with the hypothesis if it seems to contradict the hypothesis. And if it does contradict the hypothesis, then we reject the hypothesis. That's the procedure that we go through that is known as hypothesis testing, in a very small nutshell. So, in order to give you a good description of hypothesis testing, what I want to do is I want to compare it to something that we're all a little bit familiar with, and that is a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, you have an assumption. And that is, the defendant, the person who's on trial, is innocent until proven guilty. Alright? Uh, so we have somebody who's accused of murder. They were found dancing over a corpse with a bloody knife singing hallelujah. And we're thinking, well, I, even though, even though I want to think that this guy is guilty, no, I have to assume he's innocent until I can actually go through the process and prove that he is guilty. So our role is the prosecutor. We're going to prove that this guy is actually guilty. Our adversary, the defense. Our goal is, to, is like I said, to prove that that defendant is guilty. And we can't just do anything we want to, right? We have some constraints. And the constraints are the laws about obtaining evidence, there's the procedures of the trial that we have to adhere to. We must adhere to those procedures. If we don't, then we're not going to get what we want. In a hypothesis test, it is oddly similar. We have assumptions, roles, adversaries. Our assumption is the null hypothesis is true. So there's that statement, remember? Okay? We have that initial statement, the null hypothesis. Null means zero or, you know, original, nothing has changed. Uh, and so we have the null hypothesis. Uh, our role in this is the brave researcher, okay? Just like the prosecutor, we're going to prove that that null hypothesis is, well, faulty, okay? Our adversary, the status quo. Status quo simply means things as they are right now, okay? Things as they are, including this silly hypothesis, okay? And our goal just like the goal of the uh, prosecutor is to prove the defendant is guilty, our goal is to prove that the null hypothesis is preposterous, that we're going to reject the null hypothesis. We also have some constraints. Remember the conditions that we had to look at uh, for uh, um, uh, confidence intervals? We still have those same conditions now. If we can't meet those conditions, then we can't prove, that the, uh, we can't prove what we want to prove about the null hypothesis. Okay? Uh, the, uh, the, the similarities continue. With the criminal trial, what's, what, what, are, what are the tools that we use to prove our point? We use evidence, we use testimony, we use the silver tongue of the attorney. Okay? How do we win? We win by proving our case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now this is kind of a weird uh, concept here, reasonable doubt. Frequently, when the judge is giving the jury their instructions, there'll be one of the jurors that, that the instructions will be, you must find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And a juror will, will raise his or her hand and say, uh, what do you mean, reasonable doubt? And the judge's response is, well, that's up to you. If you have a doubt in your mind, you have to ask yourself, is this doubt reasonable or is this doubt crazy? Uh, we found the defendant with a bloody knife, dancing over the corpse, singing hallelujah, and uh, 
if the only doubt that you have is, well, gosh, maybe he has a long-lost twin, it's kind of unreasonable, all right? Or maybe this wasn't really him, maybe it was a hologram. Again, eh, that's a pretty unreasonable doubt. If those are the only doubts you have, well, then you might be finding this guy guilty. Um, how do we lose? Well, we lose if the jury concludes that the evidence might be the result of something else. Okay, maybe the guy actually does have a twin. Uh, you know, then, then maybe we saw somebody else. Uh, maybe, I, 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 you can decide what it might be. But that's how we might lose. So, in a hypothesis test, what are the tools that we use? We use data. We use the rules of probability, and that culminates in a p-value. So, you're asking yourself, p-value? What, what is a p-value? I'll tell you real fast what it is. A p-value is, we have assumed that the null hypothesis is true. What's the probability of getting data as weird as we got if we assume the null hypothesis is true? That's exactly what a p-value is. Okay? So it's, well, it's a, uh, uh, if the p-value is very low, that means we have found that there's a very low probability of finding data this weird if that null hypothesis is true. If that p-value is very low, then we call the data statistically significant, or we call it the statistics we get from the, from the data statistically significant, and that statistically significant is something akin to a reasonable doubt, okay? It's something that, it, it, it's, it's sort of like saying, is this surprising? Is it really surprising? If it's so surprising that it makes you doubt the very hypothesis that you assumed was true, then it's statistically significant. Uh, now, how do we lose? We lose by concluding that there's a reasonable chance that this weird data that we found is actually just natural variation, okay? We have seen that there's variation in anything. There's variation in, our, in the, the, uh, the values of p-hat that we get uh, based on the, the size of the sample that we chose. Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe... You know, it's a little off, but maybe that can just be explained by natural variation. So, what is said if we do what we're supposed to do and we win our, uh, our criminal trial? What is said is, we find the defendant guilty. What about if we lose? Well, then what's said is, we find the defendant not guilty. Notice that they didn't say, we find the defendant innocent. They said, we find the defendant not guilty. Why? Well, remember, you assumed the defendant was innocent from the very beginning. So you don't conclude he's innocent. You already assumed that. What you conclude is, we couldn't prove he was guilty. Okay? That's what we conclude. So we find the defendant not guilty. You, you'll never hear a criminal trial at the end saying, they proved he was innocent. No. They found that he was not guilty. Same with a hypothesis test. Uh, what is said if we win? We reject the null hypothesis. What is said if we lose? We fail to reject the null hypothesis. Notice we're saying we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We never say we accept the null hypothesis. Okay? Look at that prosecuting attorney at the end of the trial. Does he stand up and go, oh, gosh, I guess I was wrong. I guess the defendant really is innocent. Now, they never do that. At the end of the trial, they look down and they go, I still think he's guilty. I just wasn't able to make my case. Same thing with the researcher. Okay, the researcher at the very end, if we do our hypothesis test and we fail to reject the null hypothesis, the researcher doesn't say, well, gosh, I guess the null hypothesis is true then. The researcher says, no, I still think, I still think that null hypothesis is, uh, uh, is false, that I can reject it. I just didn't get enough data. I, I wasn't able to do it. Now, fortunately, in the, uh, uh, in the prosecutor's case, they have a law known as double jeopardy, and they can't go back to trial again. We can, okay? We can go out and go more, get more data and say, ha-ha, now I can reject the null hypothesis. So it's kind of... This way, it's much better to be a researcher than it is to be a prosecutor. Okay, so now, given all that stuff, 
Let's look at an example here. And our example says, a newspaper cites a 30-year-old statistic claiming that 85% adult, of adults in their 20s have at least a high school education. You think, you look at that and you think, hmm, that seems low. I thought it would be higher than that. Okay? And so, because you think that proportion may be higher, and uh, because eh, you've got nothing to do this weekend, you go out and you take a random sample of 160 adults in their 20s. A random sample. Careful how you gather that data, okay? It's a random sample of 160 adults in their 20s, and what you find is 146 of them have at least a high school education. Okay? Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that... Uh, oh, I went the wrong way. First, we state our hypotheses. Okay, that's the very first thing you do. State your hypothesis, and, and, and the null hypothesis here is 85% of adults in their 20s have at least a high school education. Now, I don't believe that. What I believe, what I'm going to try to prove is the alternative hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis in this case is, whoa, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the, the notation, okay? The notation for writing null hypothesis is H with a zero subscript, okay? H null, okay? So H null is that P is 0.85, okay? Now my alternative hypothesis is that more than 85% of adults in their 20s have a high school education. And in case you're thinking, well, why more? Why not less? Well, because it says up in the problem that I think that it may be higher today. If I thought it was lower, then my alternative hypothesis would be less than 85%. And this is written H sub A, is that P is greater than 0.85. Now I want to stop here for a second. And I want to point out a couple of things about this. First off, the, uh, the null hypothesis is almost always written with an equal sign, as an equality. Okay? Every once in a while it will be written as greater than or equal to, but as for all intents and purposes, it's an equality there. Okay? And you'll see why it has to be an equal sign in just a second. The, al the alternative hypothesis, always written as an inequality. Okay? It can be one of three inequalities. It can say greater than, it can say less than, it can say not equal to, but it must be an inequality. The alternative hypothesis is never an equal sign there, okay? The other thing that I want to point out is these are P's. These are not P hats. They are P's. The hypotheses, both null and alternative, are talking about the population proportion or the true proportion, not the sample proportion. I can find out what the sample proportion is really easily. I'll just go take a sample. Okay? We're talking about the population or true proportion. That's what our hypothesis is concerned with. Now, so those are our two hypotheses. And so, uh, remember, gotta, uh, gotta follow the rules before we play the game. So let's make sure that our conditions uh, are intact here. First one is randomization. And it's said in the problem that the sample was random, so we're good to go there. Second one, independence. Uh, so first of all, ask yourself, is it reasonable to assume independence? Well, yeah, it's reasonable to believe that one person's educational attainment is independent from another person's. So, okay, that part's good. And in addition to that, my sample is smaller than 10% of the population because my sample of 160 is easily less than 10% of everybody who's in their 20s. Uh, and then finally, the... Uh, um, uh, the normal uh, is the normal model appropriate. Uh, and in order to check that out, I have to find uh, NP, the expected number of uh, successes, and NQ, the expected number of failures. In this case, NP is 0.85 times 160, which is 136, greater than 10. And NQ is 0.15 times 160, which is 24, also greater than 10. Since they're both greater than 10, that means we can use the normal model. Now, I want to point out a difference between what I just did here and what we did for uh, confidence intervals. Notice, we are not using 146 here. We're not using our P hat. We're not using the number of successes and failures that we actually saw. Okay? The only reason we used P hat and Q hat in, uh, with confidence intervals is we had no idea what P and Q were. Well, this time, we have been told what P and Q are. 
We don't believe it, but we have been told that, and we've also been told that we have to assume it's true until we prove it otherwise. So, when you're checking your conditions, still continue assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So we don't use NP hat, we use NP, the P coming from the null hypothesis. Okay? So, we met our conditions, we're good to go. So since we met our conditions, we can say that the null hypothesis tells us that we have a normal distribution here. A normal distribution that is centered around 0.85. And that's the distribution of our P hats, okay? Our sample proportions uh, of, and, and, you know, as many uh, samples of size 160 that we can possibly take. Now, we're going to look at our P hat in just a second. If our P hat is way up here, like way out on the tail, we will be able to reject our null hypothesis. Because that means our P hat would be bizarrely high. And we would look at that and would say, ooh, that's weird, that's strange. That's so strange that I reject the very assumptions that, uh, that went into building this model here. Okay? Now, if P hat is anywhere else along here, like if it's really, really low, well, that doesn't support my argument at all. Or if it's kind of in here, well, then that's really not strange enough to reject the notion that uh, the proportion, the true proportion, is actually 85%. So that's kind of the model, the visual model of what we're doing here. So let's go ahead and crunch the numbers now. Uh, according to our null hypothesis, n, our sample size, is 160. That's actually true. It's not just according to the null hypothesis. But according to the null hypothesis, p is 0 0.85. So that means the expected value of p hat would be uh, p times n, which would be 136. And the standard deviation of p hat is 0.85 times 0.15, p times q over n. And we're taking the square root of that whole thing. And that comes out to about 2.82%. want to stop again, just for a second, and point out that when we were, when we were calculating confidence intervals, we didn't use standard deviation. We use the standard error, meaning we use p hat and q hat here. Why do we use the standard deviation? Because we have the standard deviation. Okay? The only reason we used the standard error before is we didn't know what p and q were. Okay? We couldn't use the standard deviation. This time we can. Again, we're given p. We don't believe it, but we have to assume it's true, so we use it in the calculation of the standard deviation of p hat. So that's what the, that's what the null hypothesis tells us. Now, what does our data tell us? Well, our data tells us that p hat, the p hat that we saw, is 146 over 160, which is 91.25%. Indeed, it's higher than the 85%. Okay. Now, how much higher is it? Well, we'll, we'll see. Uh, let's, let's look at the z-score, because the z-score, we got a good idea of what those are, and what a weird z-score looks like. Uh, the z-score of p hat is... We take our, our observed value, minus the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and what do we get? We get 2.214. That's, that's pretty out there, okay? 2.214. Remember, if you get two standard deviations above the mean, then the probability of it being that big or bigger is only 2.5%, and this is actually more than that. And sure enough, if we grab our calculator and do the math, we'll find that our p-value, the probability that p hat is at least as big as 0.9125, given these assumptions, comes out to only 1.34%. Hmm, well, that's pretty small. Okay, that is a very unlikely event. And so at this point I would conclude, well, because there is only a 1.34 chance of getting a sample proportion this low, according to the null hypothesis, I reject the null hypothesis. There is significant statistical evidence that the actual proportion of adults in their 20s with at least a high school education is greater than 85%. Notice, I'm not saying what it is. I'm just saying this null hypothesis of 85%, not accurate. It's greater than 85%. Okay, this red sentence here, write that down. Okay? Now would be a good time to hit the pause button and just copy this red sentence here.
because this is the type of sentence that you'll be writing as your conclusion uh, to a, a hypothesis test. Okay, did you hit the, the, the pause button, write it down? I hope so, because now we're ready to go again. Okay, so let's go back to our original problem, and let's say that we're tweaking it somewhat. This time, same, same newspaper, same statistic, but this time, I don't really have an idea of the uh, proportion of uh, people in their 20s that have at least a high school education. All I'm focusing on is, man, that's an old statistic. Come on, man, we ought to update that thing. So I don't have, an, uh, I don't have any kind of uh, pre-existing doubt about whether it's too low or too high. I just think it's probably wrong. All right? Well, if that's the case, my null hypothesis is still 85% of adults in their 20s have at least a high school education, but this time, and, and we still write it that way, but this time my alternative hypothesis is not it's greater than 85%, not it's less than 85%, simply it's not 85%. Something other than 85% of adults in their 20s have at least a high school education. That's what my alternative hypothesis is. And the way we write that is P is not equal to 0.85. So I think maybe it's lower than that, maybe it's higher than that. I just don't think it's 0.85 anymore because times change. All right? So again, our null hypothesis says we're centered around uh, 0.85. Okay? But this time, in order to reject it, it can be weird in this direction or weird in this direction. Okay? As long as it's far enough away from 0.85, I can reject my null hypothesis. If it's somewhere here in the middle, kind of close to 0.85, I'm going to fail to reject it. I'm not going to be able to, get to, to reject that null hypothesis. So, last time, I would calculate the p-value by calculating the probability that the sample proportion would be at least as great as our observed value. So I would say, what's the, what's the probability that it's this value or bigger? This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the probability that it's either this big or this small. Okay? In other words, that it's at least as far away from the proposed value that the mean is okay, than the null hypothesis mean. It's at least as far away as the, the weird data that I got. Okay? So, crunch the numbers again. The left side, exactly the same. Why is it exactly the same? Because our null hypothesis hasn't changed. Okay? The right side, a little bit different. Okay? We still have a p hat of 91.25. Uh, the z score of that p hat is still the exact same. This time, what we really want to focus on is how far away is my p hat from uh, p? It's uh, 0.9125 minus 0.85, which is 6.25%. It's that far away. Okay? Because what I want to do is, my p-value, okay, remember, that's the probability of getting data this weird, assuming that our null hypothesis is true. The p-value is now the probability that p-hat is greater than 0.9125 or less than or equal to 0.7875. Where did this come from? Well, that's the, that's the left tail, okay? That's the part uh, that would be... 85% um, minus 6.25%. Okay? So we take the difference there that is greater than, and we say, what's the probability of being out here and also whoosh, yeah, out here? Okay? So, uh, and what's that probability? The probability is 0 0.0268. You might notice that that's exactly twice what it was last time. Well, that makes sense, right? because now I have one tail over here and one tail over here. Two tails compared to one. It's understandable that it would be twice, twice the probability. So, uh, uh, is that what I... Yes, okay. So, things to remember about uh, uh, hypothesis testing. First off, that's how you write your null and uh, alternative hypothesis. H, H, O, or H, null. You always write it P equals something. Very occasionally will you see it as a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. But, now, I said you'll see why in a second. Well, we had to draw a model, right? 
we had to draw a model that was, uh, whoa, 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 come back. Uh, where is it? Okay, this model right here. If our null hypothesis is an inequality, if it doesn't tell me exactly what it thinks uh, P is, what am I going to put in the middle here? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to know what to do. It has to be, uh, to be phrased that way. So, um, uh, let's go back to, there we go, okay? So that's why the, uh, the null hypothesis must be written as an equality, okay? Where if it's not written that way, it's treated that way. The alternative hypothesis must be written as uh, an inequality, okay? It could be less than, it could be greater than, that's a, what's called a one-tailed test, or it could be uh, not equal to which is known as a two-tailed test, okay? Uh, hypotheses, another thing to remember, hypotheses are about parameters, not about statistics, okay? So your hypothesis here talks about P. It doesn't talk about P hat, it talks about P. Hypotheses describe the populations, they don't describe the samples. The p-value, what is the p-value? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is either true or it's not true. There's no probability associated there at all. Okay? There's no random variable. All right? uh, what it is, it's the probability of our getting data as weird as our data is, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Okay? Remember, the random variable is p hat. The random variable is associated with a random event, a random occurrence, and that random occurrence is the sample I happen to grab. I grab a random sample, that random sample generates a, a p hat, okay, a sample proportion, and that sample proportion is my random variable, okay? So the p value is the probability of getting data as extreme, I called it weird, but I guess extreme is a slightly nicer word, as extreme as what we got assuming that the null hypothesis is true, okay? Remember, you must always assume the null hypothesis is true until that moment that you are able to reject it, okay? Also, don't forget to check your conditions, and again, assume the null hypothesis is true while checking them. Again, the null hypothesis is assumed to be true until the moment that we're able to reject it, just like I said, okay? And that's your intro to hypothesis testing.